Jocelyn Whipple, and I am a TA for LSAT Unplugged with Steve Schwartz. I will be your host for this hour. Uh, during this interview, please feel free to ask questions in the chat. If you wish to remain anonymous, please send me your questions directly. With that being said, let me introduce our guest for this session. It is my pleasure to welcome to the LSAT Unplugged community, Drea. Drea just finished her first year at Georgetown Law in this in their evening program. She hosts her own YouTube channel called Drea Jackie, and the link should be in the chat below. Uh, she discusses her experiences as a full-time employee and part-time law student. And when Drea isn't attending class, she's working full-time, spending time with her husband, cat, and dog. She's a native from St. Louis, Missouri, and a first-generation law student. Her hobbies include running, hiking, climbing, and of course, YouTube. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Drea. Uh, can you tell the audience a little bit about yourself and by law? Yeah, that sounds great. Um, and I appreciate the introduction. Um, just to kind of overview, um, I have a channel on YouTube called Drea Jack Hay, where I talk about my experiences as a part-time law student and full-time employee, um, which means that I am all the time super tired. And I think that's I think that intro pretty much covered it. Um, first generation law student um, from St. Louis, Missouri. And I wish there were more interesting things for me to say, but that's pretty much the gist of it. It's all good. It's all good. I love your um, cold openings with the cat. And I was surprised you had a dog because um, I don't see the dog. It doesn't have a guest appearance. So I was like, oh, wait, she has a dog too. So I, know I do. Cool. Yeah, she's very quiet. She um, is also, they're both rescues from um, the Arlington Welfare League. And my cat is just a little more mobile. My dog is very quiet and likes to kind of tend to herself. So that's why we, I've never shown her on any of my videos. Oh, it's all good. It's all good. So can you tell me a little bit about what, why you decided to go to law school? Um, you have a pretty amazing journey and let's roll, roll it back, you know, to, I guess, your undergrad years, right? Where you were kind of deciding, should I go, should I not go, but not quite sure. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I think I did not go to undergrad um, and or even finish undergrad with the expectation of going to law school. So I'll start with that. And I think I had a very um, maybe and I think this is the case of most part time or evening students. We, we oftentimes have a very non-traditional kind of trajectory on how we got to where we did. Um, the reason why I decided to go to law school and I will say like once I was in undergrad, I thought about law school. Um, but as someone who doesn't have any lawyers in my family, um, doesn't really, you know, in my immediate family, no one has a professional degree um, and will be the first lawyer in my, you know, immediate and extended family. The after college plan really was not something that I even thought through. So when I got there, I decided to major in political science, as many people that go to law school do, big surprise. And I'm one of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's the, that's the way. And I think that, you know, it makes a lot of sense. Mind you, you can major in anything and still go to law school. Um, but I met a professor who, you know, had us meet uh, at the time, Sonia Sotomayor's law clerks. And I had no idea what law clerks were. And I, you know, was new to DC in general. But I looked at them and I was like, oh my gosh, that seems like a really cool job. Like I want that job one day. Um, mind you, I had no idea uh, how difficult and crazy um, it is to actually get to that place. So I will say like, that might not necessarily be in the cards at this point. Um, but I think that was kind of my introduction to people who had gone to law school. And ever since then, um, my professor, professor said, you know, major in something that you think you can get straight A's in, um, or almost near straight A's. And that's kind of where I kind of started at least planting the seeds. And once I graduated, I was like, I have no idea what I want to do, but I know that I can't afford law school um, and worked um, in DC for, oh gosh, I worked at Whole Foods while I was in college, worked at the Apple store when I graduated, which was like the funnest job ever. Um, and then I started working just, you know, my, my broader full-time job. Um, and I've been there for about six years now. So um, anyway, how did I get to law school? Sorry, I'm like totally digressing. No, it's totally all awesome. <laughs> totally uh, awesome. But I, I really just, I decided to go to law school because I think it's a asset to where I work currently. Um, 
and I really saw, like, I got to work around a lot of lawyers. Obviously, DC has a crap ton of lawyers. There's no shortage of people with law degrees here. Um, and just being around those people and seeing that oftentimes the people that made it to the job that I want to have in 20, 30 years, mind you, I don't exactly know what that is, but people who had idea, you know, jobs that I thought were cool had a law degree. And I felt that, you know, in order to kind of get myself to that next level and to kind of not box myself in career-wise in DC, I need to be competitive with the rest of the people here. Um, and much of that involves getting a law degree. So that's my story. That's awesome. So did you start your undergrad in the DMV area? I've, I've done some internships in DC, so I totally feel and understand what you're saying there. Um, did you? Yeah, yeah. So I attended Howard University in DC, which is, in my opinion, like the best school in DC. I'm sure many people will disagree, um, but I'm very biased. And I, I think that also goes for their law school. Like I, I'm a Georgetown student, um, but I think if Howard had a part-time program, I would have been there. Um, and that's just, that's just how highly I think of my alma mater. That is awesome. So I was curious. I was like, I thought she said at some point in one of her videos, she went to uh, HBCU for undergrad. And that just speaks to the Black excellence right there, that you were exposed uh, to something you hadn't even thought about, uh, which I think is so amazing. Um, and even though I did, went to a PWI, I wish I'd had that kind of like opportunity. Um, so with that being said, you are a YouTuber. So at what point did you decide, hey, I need to document this. I need to document my journey. I need to let the world know how I'm just a boss out here. Uh, what, what, <laughs> what point did you decide? Um, I wouldn't call myself a boss uh, quite yet, but maybe one day. Um, I got into YouTube, I think, in college and my videos like had really, really bad quality. Um, and I had no idea about like video quality or sound quality or anything of the like. Um, but I started making videos about my hair. Um, I was really into, I'd, I'd started locks a few years prior and was documenting that journey and put up a video, I think my sophomore or junior year and it ended up getting like 30,000 views, which for me was a really big deal. Um, but just to generally in the YouTube space for people with channels as small as mine, that was a huge deal. And I was like, whoa, like this seems really cool. And it kind of snowballed from there. So I didn't actually start talking about law school more generally until I started applying. Right. And I think that didn't happen until I would say last summer, around last summer, around this time last year, I decided and had seen other people post videos on YouTube, but a lot of it had to do with, um, actually, interestingly, I'm very much like a Reddit person. I love Reddit. And I was on the law school admission subreddit. Um, and I saw people like occasionally post videos there. And I was like, oh, like, let me try this out. Um, and it kind of snowballed from there. I, I, mind you, these are, you know, most of my videos are not, um, you know, I don't, I don't have as many law school videos as, as some that are exclusively focused on their law school experience. So I just want to put that caveat out there. Um, but it, it, I think is, has become an area that I don't run out of content because I think, um, I am always thinking of new ways to kind of present information to people that might not, you know, necessarily have thought about certain parts of the process. Um, and, it's kind of just continued from there. And I love talking about it too. So, and in case you can't tell. Oh, definitely, definitely. So when I was going through your videos, I got like a lot of insight. Um, and actually I was very appreciative of the videos you were doing on locks as well, because that's something I was trying to figure out if I wanted to do. So I was like, thank you for your transparency. Cause that's like super important, especially for black and brown women and men. Like we don't get that transparency of the process and um and it, especially the admissions process um let alone hair and all of those things and so um i have to say i totally appreciate that we're going to switch a bit uh switch some gears a little bit and talk a little bit more about the admissions process so first off you decided to take a couple gap years um and i think that's a fantastic thing i i did it i did not um matriculate directly from undergrad to JD. And I, I think I'm better for it, but can you explain to folks, you know, what was your thought um, process in taking a break before jumping right into Georgetown? 
Yeah. Um, so I would love to paint that picture of myself. Like, you know, I had this very grandiose plan to take all of these gap years. Um, but I'll start by saying I took way more than I anticipated. And I um, guilted myself for the entire time that I was not in law school. So I, even though I was working, you know, full-time and a part-time job, um, I spent a lot of my time kind of pressing myself on, oh, I need to apply to law school. Oh, I need to apply to law school. Um, so despite me taking those gap years and getting that work experience, which I, I definitely recommend, um, and for, for, for no other reason other than like you get to know yourself in that time outside the context of school. And um, I think there's a lot of value to that. But, you know, those gap years, I think if you work in, you know, for example, working period is going to help you, but like working in an industry that's actually related to what you want to go into after you graduate um, is, is really helpful. Um, and, you know, I took those gap years partially because I needed to also kind of get my mental space ready. I was not, I don't think I was mentally ready to go to law school when I graduated from undergrad. Um, I wasn't mentally ready for a lot of things. And, and again, that gap helped me kind of get there. Um, and a lot of it was also cost. So I do not, you know, like I am part of the reason why part-time law school works well for me is because um, I don't have to take out the copious amounts of loans that a lot of full-time students are faced with. Um, and I, you know, told myself I was going to save uh, up a certain amount of money before I would apply to law schools. You know, I had to pay all of those application fees. Um, you have to pay the seat deposits, which are like yeah. outlandish. Um, and, you know, I just, I had to have kind of like my little nest egg ready to get myself to actually um, the jump off point. So I would say one, I didn't anticipate as many gap years as I you know, took um, and two financial costs um, or financial reasons. And then I also wanted to get my test scores to a specific place too. Um, I took the LSAT when I was an undergrad, uh, did not do so great on it. And really, you know, I, my scores expired. So I had to take the GRE, um, or decided to take the GRE in, in lieu of the LSAT. So a, a combination of different things kind of led me to the five gap years that I took. Um, would I recommend that to people? I, I'm not quite sure, you know, but I think I think it does help to kind of get some work experience that's relevant to where you want to go afterwards. Right. So let's, we're going to unpack this story, right? Because it's, it's totally amazing to see this journey, right? So you talked about a mental headspace, right? Can you share with us as far as the mental aspect of, you know, going to law school, whether it's part-time or full-time, there's a mental aspect. Uh, can you share with us what, what that looks like, what that means? Because when you, when you hear people talk about, oh, you know, I have to do this in my mind and all that and being mentally prepared, what does that look like? What does that mean? Yes. Um, I think law school is not for the weak of mind. I'll, I'll just kind of sum it up that way. It is the most, challenging experience I've had academically in my entire life. Um, and I say that as someone who has never um, struggled with school by any means of the word. Um, and I don't even say that to be um, kind of like tooting my own horn, but school has always been something that kind of just came naturally to me. And I could, you know, get straight A's and not have to work too hard for them. But that is so not the case in law school. Um, and I think you really have to be mentally prepared for a marathon rather than a sprint. Um, it's, for, for example, your entire grade for a class might be based off of one exam. Oftentimes that is the case. Um, so it's really a matter of keeping your headspace clear um, and keeping it in a place where you feel almost zen to handle an entire semester of keeping up, making sure that you're in the right place. Um, in law school, you get no feedback, um, even after you take your exams. So you have to really be a, a kind of a self-starter and go-getter. So um, all of that is to say, I also think mental health in law school is not something that is stressed as much as it should be. Um, and I think and hope that's something that you know, I can encourage people to take 
account of kind of going forward in their experience. Um, I think oftentimes, you know, the people that apply to law school have these very strong type A personalities and myself, um, I, I don't see myself in as exception to that in any way. But I think we tend to push ourselves in ways that um, can be kind of repressive to the other aspects of who we are. Um, and I'm trying to, you know, that's a journey for me too, that I'm trying to kind of break out of that space and, and put my mental space before I put my work or my schoolwork or something like that. Um, and I think the, the folks that I've seen do really well have really maintained that balance or done their best to kind of adhere to that balance um, and be mindful of it. Wow, that is so insightful um, as far as how to, I guess. So you're saying basically you've got to work on yourself. Basically, it's a it's a journey that not only assists you, right? If that's if that journey is for you, right? That's caveat, right? You've got to say, you know, say, oh, it's for everyone because it's it's not. Um, but there's that aspect of self care and making sure that you're in a good headspace to deal with all of the. The, the rigors and challenges of being in law school, regardless of whether you're full-time or not. For sure, um, so yeah. So you mentioned uh, the, uh, the LSAT, right? So we're LSAT, one plug, and of course, I've got to ask an LSAT question, yes, of course. Um, so you said that you, um, you know, you decided, well, initially you took the LSAT, right? Your scores expired, and then you switched to the GRE. What impacted your decision to apply with GRE scores instead of, you know, cranking out the LSAT? I'm just curious. Yeah, that's a that's a good question too. Honestly, at the time, and this is pre-COVID, when I took the GRE, you could take it when you wanted, um, and you would get, or sorry, you could just kind of choose a day, and it was all online. It was close to me. Um, it had mostly to do with the convenience of the test rather than the test itself. Um, I think if I would have put in the amount of work that I put into studying for the GRE into the LSAT, I would have done equally well. Um, but I will say as someone, like I took the, took all of my standardized tests when I was working full time and it was really, it was tough. Um, and having the flexibility of, okay, I can go in, you know, at a time that I'm ready as opposed to having to register for something months and months and months in advance and not even know that I would feel equipped to actually, you know, take that test at that time um, is the reason why I was driven more towards the GRE than the LSAT. Now with LSAT, is it LSAT um, flex? I think I know that things have changed well, quite a bit. It, so I, yes, yeah. June is the last um, LSAT flex and then they're switching over to um, four section. Mm. Okay, so there are, does that mean that they're going back to the old model that they used? No, so it'll still be, they'll still have more test dates available. Um, it's just, and it'll still be the 35 minute sections. It's just, they have to add an experimental section. And that's yeah. what that fourth one is because, you know, uh, uh, up until June, which is, you know, coming up, it's only been three sections with no experimental. Um, and so, you know, for Elsa, uh, to essentially, you know, be able to test questions and that sort of thing, they have to add an experimental. Yeah, that makes sense. Know. They ran out, so <laughs> no, I'm, yeah. I'm kidding. They may have. I don't know. Definitely, yeah. So that is very like insightful um, about you know what went into your process um, between you know taking the LSAT, taking the LSAT after your score expired in the GRE. Um, I was curious, um, you know with this overall process, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, studies have shown that black applicants are having the hardest times, you know, in navigating the admissions process. And even according to LSAC uh, data, um, there's definitely been an increase of black applicants. Their rate of admission um, is still the same. It's still under 10%, right? So were you able to find support um, I know that, you know, you and Latasia, I believe you did an interview. Yeah, with she's amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, you guys talked about the importance of mentors um, and inquiring coaches. So can you elaborate for me? What, what, how, how did you go about doing so? And how did that help you um, during this process? Um, so I guess the, how did I find mentors specifically? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, that's a, also a great question. I think... I, so where I work, um, 
I had no shortage of amazing black people around me who are doing really cool things and also had law degrees. Um, I think a lot of it just is going to depend on your environment. Um, that is a benefit of being in the DC or DMV area is that I would argue that it is objectively one of the best areas for black people because of the amount of opportunities that are available here. Um, and it's, you know, I think, and especially areas that have HBCUs in them. Um, so this is not unique to DC um, because there are HBCUs all over the country, but areas that have stronghold HBCUs um, tend to have a lot of black talent that is doing extremely well. Um, and when I, and I, I don't think that's different than graduates or black graduates from PWIs. That's not for me to, um, you know, I'm not trying to down PWI graduates in any way, but what I will say is that HBCUs are a high concentration of black people who are doing really well. Um, and I think that certainly contributes to the area um, and the demographic of people that are there and the access and opportunities that they have. So a lot of it has been, you know, having access to those people at work. Um, but a lot of it has also been like straight up just cold calling people who, and by cold calling, that might be a cold email um, in 2021. But, you know, the old school me is kind of going back to cold call days, but reaching out to people who if I see that they've done something really cool and they've done something that I think is extremely interesting or they had a career trajectory that I have admired, um, I've reached out to those people and I will say sometimes I don't get a response and that can be disappointing, but I will miss 100% of the shots that I don't take. Um, and if that person responds, I think it's all that much more worth it to take those kinds of opportunities. So if I had to kind of name the best ways to find mentors, um, cold calls or cold, cold outreach, um, for example, like people will reach out to me for advice on law school admissions, and I have responded to all of them. And the reason for that is because I know what it's like to be in that situation. I remember what it's like to be applying to schools and feel really kind of lost in this world that didn't feel like people around me, um, you know, knew all that much about. So I would say cold calls and reaching out to the, your networks. Um, for example, if you have family friends who have cool jobs that you wanna hear about, reach out to them through that. If you know someone who knows someone, try to get an introduction. Um, but you really just kinda, you have to be prepared to get some no's um, and to be ignored at least a couple times. Um, but I, I would guarantee that um, if you kind of do that outreach and you put yourself out there, you'll get at least a couple of mentors. Um, and I think work mentors are a great resource as well. Definitely. Awesome, awesome. Um, and so I gotta ask you, um, so you mentioned or alluded to kind of like the factors you were looking at um, in going for a part-time program. And so can you elaborate for me? There's a specific point that you mentioned. You talked about how you, you know, you really enjoyed your job and how you've always worked and, go and gone to school at the same time. And um, but you specifically said you were supported by work um, and that, you know, essentially you are in a space where your employers, they want you to succeed. And I think at you mentioned also in one of your videos how they had provided you with uh, recommendation letters, right? So can you talk about that particular aspect? That's something that I think people don't um, necessarily consider, um, you know, especially, you know, going, you know, and trying to figure out if they want to do a part-time or not. Um, but the, I think the really key thing for me was that you are definitely supported by work. Yes, I am very supported by work. I think that's a huge, huge, huge blessing. Um, that I'd say has been maybe the only thing that has gotten me past or through the past year. Um, the past year has been really, really hard. And I I think kind of the path to making part-time law school work with a full-time job is making sure that everyone is on the same page. So those little things like letting my office know, hey, I really want to do this. Um, I'm applying to this school. I would, you know, and I think the people that I work with, I've been there for quite some time. They're arguably the most equipped to document and discuss my work ethic, what it's like to kind of task me to do things, et cetera. Um, so they wrote my recommendations. I got my previous job to write me recommendations and my current job to write me recommendations. Um, and I kind of knew from the beginning that I had their support. Um, and it was something that I talked about um, with my office you know, 
years before I even did it, I, I would always talk wow. about like, oh, I'm thinking about applying to law school someday. Um, so it didn't come as a surprise to them when I actually wanted to apply. Um, and then when it came down to the actual school year starting and me working at the same time, those little things like, hey, my school year starts at this time, it ends at this time, exams are this time, um, I'm going to be taking some vacation time around exams and my office being on board and supporting me through that. Um, those little nuances and making sure that I told people well in advance what was coming down the pipeline made a huge difference. Um, and you know, those little things like just letting people know I need vacation time to take exams, like that made it so that I wasn't stressed out around exams, right? And I didn't feel like, you know, the entire world was crashing down on me. And my other coworkers also knew to and were able to make space for me at those times, right? I get a little more slack. Um, I get a little more help during those times too, because I work on a team. And you're, if you kind of make your team aware of all the moving pieces in your life, um, if they're a good team, they kind of move and ebb and flow around you in a way that will help you get to where you'd like to be. That is awesome. So we're going to switch gears to, to Georgetown, all things Georgetown. You mentioned how people really supported you and really were like, oh my goodness, like let's support Drea and help push you to help support you to your goal. Um, so with that being said, I have to say congratulations on completing your first year and Thank all the you. exams and all of that. I know it was stressful, especially during COVID. We're still kind of in COVID, um, but it, it's, it's routine light at the end of the tunnel. Um, so with the program itself, so how long is the program typically and how many classes do you have per week? Yes, so you have, um, oh gosh. 12 credit hours or no, okay. Jesus. Oh my God. That would be insane. 10, 10 to credit hours. Um, and Oh wait, no. Am I lying? No. 10. Wait, <laughs> hold on. Sorry. I'm like totally blanking on it. So my previous semester I had, I think I had 12 actually. Maybe it was 10. It was, I had three classes. One of them was four credits. One of them was four credits, one of them was two. Okay, 10, 10 credit hours. Um, so your first semester, um, you take 10 credit hours. Your second semester, you can take nine, um, but you can take an experimental course over winter break, which is worth one credit. So you can end your first year with 20 credits. Um, it's a four year program. So uh, evening students typically take that four years. You can graduate and switch to the part or full-time program at any point. Um, it, you know, for example, if you, decide that your career path is going to involve or and you know need for you to work full time or take a full time internship and that you're going to have to leave your job uh, people kind of ebb and flow in between those all the time. Um, daytime students can take evening classes and vice versa. Um, but yeah it's a four year program you take on average somewhere between 10 to 11 credit hours per semester. Um, and I think the full-time students take uh, around 15, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so it's not that big of a difference. That's usually the difference of about one class. Um, so it's a pretty pretty heavy load, really. Definitely, definitely. Um, so we actually have a question in the chat um, and kind of taking us back a little bit about the mentor role. Um, so you act, you have, you know, this role as a mentor. So, uh, you know, so I, I would say um, for cold calls, right? <laughs> when people reach out to you, um, what is it? So when you reached out, I guess, when you were doing, you know, your mentoring or reaching out for a mentor, what would you typically say in that email um, that would garner a response? Um, yeah. Um I think the best thing to do is I call it ties. So if you have any type of similarity with someone, so for example, I reached out um, a few months ago to a former Georgetown graduate and started, hey, I'm with, I'm a Georgetown student in the evening program. I saw that you also graduated from the evening program. I'm really interested in your experience in XYZ Place. Um, I wanted to ask if you would be free for coffee anytime in the coming weeks, something like that. Um, so basically finding the commonalities that you have with whatever person you're reaching out to, um, just to kind of put, uh, this is why I'm reaching out. Because the, the last thing you want to do is kind of randomly not have anything or any connection with someone. Um, I mean, you can, it's just you're less likely to get an actual response. So when you put those ties, um, or even if you see like, 
we're from the same state or we went to the same high school or, you know, little things like that, I think can go a long way because it puts a kind of location and a actual, you know, connection with whoever you're reaching out to so that they feel like, oh, okay, well, maybe I should respond to this person because I can relate to them being from the same hometown or something like that. Definitely, definitely. And with that being said, did that help you, I guess, with like what a typical day would look like or how to structure your days? Because, I, you know, it's definitely a challenge trying to balance the act, you know, with, you know, full-time work and then part-time law school and just law school in general, no matter if it's full-time or part-time, is going to be, like I said, work, right? And it's going to take focus. So what would your typical day look like? Yeah, so my typical day usually starts around 9 a.m. Um, I'll get up and eat breakfast, and I work from home, which is a huge privilege. Um, I have the privilege of working from home. So I will head over to my computer um, and usually work from around 9 until 1 p.m. I'll take a lunch break in between usually 1 p.m. and 2 p.m. That can fluctuate depending on what my work schedule looks like. And then I'll end work around 5 Um and then there's usually a gap between, I try to give myself about 30 minutes to take a nap or review my notes or something like that. It's nine times out of 10 gonna be the nap, the nap always wins. And um, I will take a nap and then class starts at 5.30. Um, on Monday, Wednesday and Thursday, I have one class. So that class will end, it's two hours, um, it'll end at 7.30. And then on Tuesday or Thursday, depending on the semester, um, I'll have two classes. So my 5.30 to 7.30 class, and then I'll have a 30 minute gap, and then I'll have another class from 8 to 10 p.m. Um, and given I'm under the impression, I'm not sure, and don't quote me on this, I'm under the impression that we're likely gonna be at least in some hybrid form of class or in person um, this upcoming semester, that my entire everything is going to shift because I'm going to have to factor in commute times. But I think not having to commute between work and school and it, you know, all just being from the convenience of my computer has been really convenient in terms of, you know, I get an extra hour and a half added to my days. Totally, totally understand that. Uh, with that being said, with, you know, adjusting schedules, right? Um, how then does the curve work for you guys, right? Because yeah, I, that's something I've always been curious about. Um, are you guys graded on a curve with separately or with the rest of the full-time class? Yes. So in short, every, um, so Georgetown's huge. And I think yes. the only other law school that's as big is Harvard. Um, but they take every, um, income, you know, every year, and they break you up into sections. So there are seven sections. Um, oftentimes, those sections, I don't know if there's that much of a science to this, but oftentimes the sections are arranged by student interest. So for example, I know in one section is geared towards um, students who are interested in public interest law. Um, but the there is an evening section um, because you have all of your classes with those people. And it will often include like, for example, this semester, we had the international students in our classes because who, you know, like if you're overseas and it's actually 4 a.m. where you are um, during the times that they host daytime classes, they wanted to give those students a better opportunity to attend class that made sense um, at a time for their schedule. So you are graded with the other students in your section, just like every other Georgetown student. Um, and we are graded with daytime students. We're graded with, um, and sorry, our curve also includes transfer students. So you, you kind of get a hodgepodge of students. If a daytime student takes classes with evening students, they're in that kind of curve as well. But the bulk of students that you're curved against are gonna be other evening students. Um, and my understanding in the past, and this is not the case every year, but in the past, typically the evening students um, tend to have a slightly higher curve, so. Oh, okay. That's interesting. Very interesting. Um, so with that being said, let's see, I'm just trying to check the chat just to make sure we don't have any more questions. Um, what is the culture like for one out? Like what can, can someone expect um, with the culture of Georgetown and especially, you know, being part-time, I'm wondering, is there a difference? Because, um, you know, you're not with, it's, 
I guess I wouldn't say a different mindset, but there's going to be different experience. And I don't want to say it's the more mature, <laughs> right? You know, no, but, we're all old. No, you know, <laughs> no, no, but um, what, what is the culture like? Because I, I kind of feel like, or I kind of think, okay, if it's, you know, if you're working full time, there's just a different presence, right? Um, then you're going to have when someone's full time. Yes. Okay. So I can only speak to what my experience has been. I haven't obviously worked with and attended class with any other section except for evening students. I can tell you what I've heard, but take that all with a grain of salt because it is, um, inform you know, it's just information that I've heard rather than had a firsthand experience with. Um, to my experience, I think the evening like cohort is a lot closer than the other sections of students. Um, part of the reason for that is because I think there's this like collective struggle that we're going through. We're all exhausted. We're all kind of just trying to navigate this the best that we can. Um, and that is not to say that daytime students aren't doing the same, but I think we're all kind of in this, you know, very specific, like you mentioned, very specific mindset. Um, and I think that drives us, the, that collective struggle has driven us all closer. Um, I have, I think I have the most badass class, classmates like on the face of the earth. Um, they all have like really, really cool jobs. Um, some of them are parents. Some of them, you know, have Wikipedia pages and like just have these really cool backgrounds. Um, we have a Slack channel and I think that's the case for most evening student. There's like a group chat or something where they kind of collaborate there. Um, but I, I think I've, I've had the privilege of having really great classmates that I've been able to get actually close to as people um, in the past year. And I've heard that the daytime sections um, don't necessarily have that experience. Um, and I don't know that they have those same kind of like chat um, interactions. And in a year where we were all very much stuck online, um, things like that made a big difference. And I think it, you know, made it a little bit fun. It was like a little, um, you know, we call our, all of the evening students are in section seven. So we have like a set, it, it was basically like a, like a, um, like a subreddit just for evening students at Georgetown. So it was great. I loved it. That is awesome. So like part of the experience, right, of going to law school is having that social interaction. And I know with COVID, it kind of, I wouldn't say limited it, but it would, it, it basically reinvented. It limited it. Oh, it, it definitely, definitely limited. okay. It reinvented like the ways in which people can connect um, and people can work together. So for you, um, how was it, how were you able to connect with your professors um, since, you know, it was your online, right? Um, does, did that mean that your classes were like smaller and that you were able to get maybe more one-on-one -on -one attention with your professor or it was more, it was kind of like, eh, not really. Yeah. I still had um, to struggle. So connections with professors, I think they are, they're, they're going to be what you make them, whether you're in class virtually or in person. So every professor has office hours available. There were some professors that I went to their office hours. Um, there were other professors where I was like, no way I'm going to their office hours. It really just depends on what you decide you want to do. Um, I think the opportunities were a little more maybe cut and dry. Um, they were, it was, I think it was possibly a little easier to kind of do office hours. Um, because oftentimes professors would have a list of times that you could sign up for and you sign up for a five minute or a 10 minute or 15 minute block. Um, and what's cool is oftentimes those office hours sometimes could be one on one with you and that professor. Um, I did have another professor who would just have group office hours. So it really it depended. But I would say having office hours was the main way to kind of get in touch with professors. Um, if there was, for example, one of my professors I thought was amazing, and I'm doing a research assistant, um, a research assistant work for him over the summer. So, you know, it's, it's going to be what you make it whether you're in person or online, but I mean, just how you would meet your professors on office hours um, and kind of get to know them through that in in-person class. That was very much the case with online classes this semester. All right, that's cool. Did it make, um, did being online make, you know, the cold calls any easier? Or I'm just um, curious for some no. people. Yeah, I no. wish. Um, but, so what's cool is like, it, and again, it depends on the class. A lot of my, my favorite professors had cold call lists. Um, so if you okay. were on call, you knew it, you know, at the beginning of the semester, but there were some professors that are like, nope, I'm just, I'm just going out there and I'm going to call on anyone. Um, and that those, those sometimes were a little intimidating and scary, but I think for the most part, we would have people that really wanted to participate in class, um, who would kind of take up that, 
um, spotlight, which was very good. Um, and, you know, I, they can take the spotlight any day if it means I don't have to be intimidated in front of my peers and answer questions that I don't know the answer to. Understand. <laughs> Understood. Um, so with your experiences in law school, um, can you tell us a little bit about like what are the differences that you, you know, notice between law school and your undergrad environment? Um, some people kind of think, oh, you know, law school is just an elevated undergrad experience or, but it's essentially, it's, it's something like no other from what I understand. Um, so can you elaborate for us what that looks yes. like for you? Um, so I think in undergrad, you just get a lot more opportunities to make your grade. So in undergrad, you may get homework, you may be graded on that homework, you may get graded on participation, you may get graded on multiple papers, you may have several assignments, you may have a midterm, you may have, oftentimes you'll have multiple opportunities to, you know, prove yourself, prove your knowledge, prove that, okay, I know what's actually going on in this class. In law school, um, not only do you oftentimes and I would say almost, ex in my first year, this was my exclusive experience. You have one exam for the entire year, um, but you're graded on a curve, right? And in undergrad, a lot of students don't have that experience. They're not graded on a curve. They're not competing with everyone in their class just to kind of, we call it securing the B plus. Um, and every, you know, I think most schools, a lot of schools publish what their curve is. The curve at Georgetown is a B plus. Um, so, you know, you're competing with everyone in your class just to be average. And another kind of big point about law school is, and I think this is, to me, if you go to law school period, I don't care what your school is ranked, I'm going to almost guarantee you're going to school with brilliant people or people who are just as capable as you are, if not more, um, sometimes less, but probably around where you are. And you have to kind of contextualize everyone around you is brilliant. And if everyone around you is brilliant, then no one is. Um, so you really have to work extremely hard. I think, you know, just having, for example, an entire semester where you have to keep up with material um, and actually understand it is also daunting. Like the amount of reading that you have to do, I would say, you know, on average per week around 150 pages minimum, that was probably where we were. Um, so having to keep up with things like that. And this is stuff that you actually have to know, right? It's not just passively like, you know, the reading was assigned and, you know, it's it's not going to be talked about later. Like, no, this is actually important substantive stuff. Um, that makes a big difference. And then also with law school class and exams are very different. Um, I think in undergrad class and exams have a little bit more of a connection. In, in um, law school, they are very different. I think part of even doing well on a law school exam, you have to practice. Um, you need to, for example, if your exam is about, you typically your exams will be around like three hours. I had one that was five hours. You need to practice that. Um, the only way that you get good at that is by doing that over and over and over again. And you do not have to do that in undergrad at all. Um, but because you only get one shot, it is so very important that when you take that shot, you get it right and that you are as, pre as prepared as you can possibly be. So I'm curious, you said there was a three hour exam that you took and then there was a five hour that I was, I didn't realize that they could be that long. Um, mm -hmm. How did you, so studying a study schedule, super important in there. Um, and so I'm curious, were you able to utilize the study habits, um, study practices that you had for the GRE or even the LSAT? Um, were they applicable to studying for these exams or just studying throughout uh, the semester? Because I know you can't study right before the exam. You have to start studying kind of, you know, or very early in the semester to make sure that you understand and know the material because once, you know, once you guys move on, it's, it's done and you better know it on the exam, essentially. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, I'd say that's about right. Um... I, so I do, I, one, I think standardized tests are iffy. Um, I, I think they are very discouraging for a lot of people who I think are more than capable of going to law school. So I'll start with that. Um, I think they prepared me in a way that is very different and that it teaches you to kind of keep at something and repeat it until you get it right, until you understand it. So I think it helps you in that aspect. Um, 
the writing section of the GRE, I think, prepared me more than anything. Um, I would say, depending on your school, but most schools are going to have all of your exams be pure essay. So having the essay section of the GRE and having to practice writing essays and writing them in a sp very specific form in a very specific format, touching on very specific issues. Um, I think that was the most applicable. And I think, you know, aside from that, mm, I can't say a whole bunch. Like it, it prepares you in that the pattern of it um, prepares you for what law school is going to be like. Um, and then the only other part that I think is applicable is the amount of time that it gets, that it takes to get your scores back. Um, a lot of people don't know this, but in law school, it takes like weeks, um, sometimes even a month to get your grades back after the semester. Like I still don't, you know, my, my semester ended two or a week and a half ago and I still don't have my grades. Um, and I remember finishing and, you know, my coworkers being like, oh, how'd you do? And I'm like, I have no idea until mid June, basically. Um, but if you kind of want to get used to and take joy in waiting for test scores, um, you know, standardized tests will prepare you for what law school will have to show you for that. Awesome. Um, so and one last question, I guess, for you is that, so you talked about practicing, right? How do you practice through these exams, especially when you get no feedback um, with the work that you do? And from what I understand, you, you do a lot of reading, but you don't necessarily have, I guess, what we consider like typical homework in undergrad where you have to turn in stuff, you know, you're accountable, you have to make sure you have your stuff by the deadline, yada, yada. Um, so how do you engage with your professors to get that feedback you need to maybe like fine tune something to help you prepare for the exam? Um, you can't. <laughs> That's really? a great question. Um, so, I mean, you, you can to the extent that you ask questions in class. Um, and I think this is a thing that many law students do and not something that I do, but they bring up hypotheticals and they say, so, you know, we'll learn about a rule and say that rule is like, I don't know, has to do with assault or battery or something. And they'll say, okay, so if I boop someone on the nose and I, you know, they didn't expect that kind of contact, um, is it battery, right? Or they'll bring up a hypothetical and the, the professor can answer your question, but that's kind of the extent of it, right? You will never have the opportunity to write something and get your professor's feedback on it directly. Um, that is just not a thing that Georgetown or most law schools are going to offer you. Um, most professors will also even say, you know, I can't look at any potential exam answers. Um, and I think mostly because if they did that for one student, they'd have to do that for every student and it could give people an unfair advantage. Um, you do have access to old exams. So every school, most schools, Georgetown has an exam bank where you can look at previous exams and Sometimes, and this is not all the time, sometimes professors will publish, you know, the best answer for that exam that that year. Um, so all of your exams are graded under a anonymous number. Um, so you won't know whose student or what student's exam it was, but you can read what the professor thought was good. However, um, oftentimes they won't tell you what their scoring rubric was. Um, and if they do, it might be really old. They might not score about that by that same rubric. Um, so it's it's tough. I mean, I'm going to be honest with you. What makes law school so hard is that you get no feedback. Um, you can get feedback from the registrar's office, I think, at the end of the semester. Um, but it's not, I don't know that it's the same thing as getting actual direct feedback from your professors. So it's, it's rough, but unfortunately, very much the experience for like every student. So, uh, you know, it's just a thing that you kind of get used to. Wow, that is so definitely valuable um, insight um, because here I'm, I'm thinking, no, well, maybe there's, you know, some leeway with, you know, giving people feedback, but no, not, not at all. No feedback. Um, and so that goes back to, you know, being in that mental space that you talked about earlier of Zen, right? Yeah. Um, and, and all kind of, you know, being able to coast the uncertainty, right? Because that's kind of, you know, what's from what I'm getting is that yeah. there's a lot of uncertainty you have to be your biggest fan because nothing in law school will be your biggest fan no one's going to be cheering you on um I mean unless you have family members and stuff like that or friends around you but in the experience itself um there's really not going to be that validation that you're probably looking for it's it's kind of the biggest game of delayed gratification and and delayed anything I mean even if you get to the end of the semester 
I mean, you get, you just get your grades, right? You don't know what you did right, what you did wrong. Um, oftentimes on exams, they're called issue spotter exams and um, students won't, you, you don't get points off for incorrect answers. So for example, if you're looking at a past exam and it has wrong everything, um, if the person wrote equally right everything, the wrong doesn't get graded and taken off of their, their exam grade. Um, but you, you as a student looking at those past exams, you don't know what's right, you don't know what's wrong, um, and you don't know what that professor saw that they liked or that they didn't like. So it's, it's rough. Um, you really do have to be self-assured. You have to be mentally strong. You have to really be a go-getter and you have to constantly tell yourself like, this is worth it. <laughs> and I should continue to do this. Cause I mean, I think most law students are, have those moments where they're like, man, this is bleak. So, but it's, I think it's worth it. Definitely, definitely. Well, uh, we are getting close to the top of the hour. And so I wanted to take the opportunity to not only thank you, but to give you um, a few minutes to cover something that we may have not even you know, covered um, and to share some final thoughts with folks, especially our black and brown, um, you know, folks out there that are, you know, looking and trying to figure out this law school admissions process and, you know, at times get frustrated and like, should I even do this right because of all the challenges that they might be facing. Um, so yeah, please, you know, let me know what your thoughts are, your final, your final yeah. thoughts are. I would say one, I want to encourage, obviously, as many black and brown students out there who want to attend law school to please go. Um, but I also will have the caveat that go where it makes sense for you to go financially. Um, if you have the finances to go to a Harvard, Stanford, Yale, um, if you get a scholarship to go to one of those schools, if you get financial aid, go. Um, but if it comes down to, and this is very taboo, if it comes down to choosing between copious amounts of debt and not having that crazy amount of debt, um, I think you inevitably will set yourself up in a place, unless you have good family resources that are, you know, any, any type of wealth that can help pay for it, you set yourself up better in the long run by not necessarily taking on um, those copious amounts of debt. So there's that. And I also want to encourage black and brown students, um, if you're thinking about law school, you know, apply, why not? But if you also have other ideas on if there's another way to get to where you would like to go, um, and that way is not just the exception, if it can also be the rule, there is nothing wrong with not going to law school. Um, there are so many really cool jobs and opportunities out there. Um, and law school is not the only way to be someone who's good at something and a high earning person and what have you. Um, I think some of the people that I admire the most have been people who have stuck with the thing that they love, whether that be art or dance or writing or anything of the sort. Um, when you stick with things you love that I think will inevitably lead people to amazing spaces. Um, for some people that's law school. For someone like me, that is law school, but that is not the case for everyone. So um, my final points are one, apply, like definitely apply and kind of, you know, shoot your shot, take your shot. Don't let anyone discourage you. Don't let your test scores, don't let any of that um, convince you that this is not your place. Because I promise you, there are plenty of students that aren't black and brown who don't, you know, think twice about making these decisions. Um, and then two, finances very much do matter. Um, you know, I, I don't think, and I would not want to advise anyone to put themselves in a financial position that isn't going to be good for them in the long run. Um, and I think you have to look out for your finances in, in law school because no one is going to do that for you. Um, and then my, my final point is law school is not the only cool thing out there. There are really, really cool things out there. And if you are really talented and passionate about something, I can almost promise you that will take you just as far, if not further, than law school will. Well, that is so, so wonderful um, advice. And thank you so much for, you know, for sharing your story and sharing your journey. And I look forward to seeing more videos from you. Um, I know you, you know, you, you post them whenever you can. And so um, I totally enjoy them and hopefully we'll get to see the dog. Yes. Oh, I should. She's sleeping, but my cat also had some yelling at me moments, but didn't jump up here. So I'm actually really impressed, but I'll, I'll feature them in something soon. Um, but awesome. thank you to you as well. Um, I think you've done such a great job with this and 
I think it's it's hard to interview people. Like I don't think people re recognize how tough that is sometimes. So kudos to you for doing such a great job. Um, it's been a, a great opportunity to meet you and and get questions today. So thanks for watching. Well, thank you so, so much. And thank you everyone else for joining us. Uh, please remember that the session is recorded so you can refer to it again on YouTube and all their other socials. Also check out Steve's interview with Drea on her YouTube channel called Drea Jackie. And be on the lookout for more tips on navigating your law school admissions journey on the LSAT Unplugged channel. Until next time, thank you everyone so much and see you then. Thanks for tuning into the show. Please subscribe if you haven't done so already to be notified of new episodes as I release them. And feel free to reach out if you need anything at all as you move forward with your prep. I'm happy to help however I can. In the meantime, I wish you all the best and take care.